All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel Schindler. I'm on the faculty here at the University of Washington. And uh, thanks for tuning in for a bit of an overview um, of our forecast for next summer and some of the other things that may be on your minds with respect to ocean climate and these sort of things. Uh, we typically do this for the processors every year. And this year, Andy Wink encouraged us to do it for the uh, for the fleet as well, particularly now that everyone's uh, Zoom friendly. Um, anyhow, I'm just going to turn it over to Andy briefly for a couple opening comments. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, just want to thank everyone for being here today, and uh, especially to Chris, Chris Broatwright, Daniel Schindler, Curry Cunningham, Dan Ovando, and Ray Hilborn for setting up this webinar to share their research insights. Uh, BBRSDA is proud to be a funding partner for a really important UW research efforts, which provide a deeper understanding about Bristol Bay's unparalleled salmon run. Uh, this fishery's incredible size is really our biggest asset. And we're fortunate to have an amazing uh, group of scientists who can help us all understand as much as possible about this resource. And that helps support BBRSDA's goals of protecting critical salmon habitat and maximizing sustainable harvest volume. Um, if you'd like to learn more about these projects and other activities funded through BBRSDA, please check out our website at bbrsda.com. Uh, if you go to projects option at the top menu and click on final reports, you can find more info there. Uh, also, we have a lot of useful inform information for members in the For the Fleet section, which is also at the top menu uh, dealing with COVID assistance, quality improvement, marketing, as well as market info. Um, so we're really excited about this webinar. Uh, I know our fishermen are going to learn a ton today. Uh, if you have friends who couldn't make it, uh, let them know that they'll be able to watch these presentations on BBRSDA's YouTube channel later this week. Uh, we'll post a link to that on our website, or you can just search BBRSDA in YouTube and probably find it that way. So thanks a lot. Happy to be here. Daniel, take it away. All right. Thanks, Andy. Um, just a heads up to people online who may have questions. Uh, the way it's set up here, um, if you have a question about any of the specific uh, presentations, each presentation will be five minutes or so, uh, please use the Q&A box to type in your question. Um, or if you would like to say something, I think we can enable you to allow, allow you to say something as well. But if you have a specific question about any of the talks, uh, just type it in. Um, and then we'll have a, an open floor general Q&A at the end of all the presentations uh, today. And as Andy said, uh, we're recording this. So um, if you wanna follow up later, uh, you can do it. So the, we'll start with Chris Boatwright today who will provide an overview of our forecast for the 2021 sockeye run. All right, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, is uh, Daniel, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna do a review of the 2021 UW FRI preseason forecast. So I like to start this review uh, each year with the most basic forecast table we generate. And that's what's on the screen right now. So this table we're looking at is simply 30, the 36 individual predictions that sum to give us the Bristol, total Bristol Bay forecast. So these 36 individual predictions, they're organized here by the nine major river systems in Bristol Bay, by each of the four dominant age classes of sockeye that return to Bristol Bay. And of course, uh, these individual predictions sum to 50.9 million sockeye expected back to Bristol Bay in the 2021 season. So I'd like to take a step back from there and consider or show the primary data set that uh, our forecasts are built on. So what we're looking at here on the screen are Bristol Bay sockeye salmon returns 1963 to 2020. Um, 
there, of course, the horizontal axis across the bottom is the time series in years. And then the left-hand axis is in numbers of fish. It runs up to 70 million. So uh, running up to 70 million for that axis is a testament to just how productive Bristol Bay is in terms of sockeye salmon. So there's certainly a lot here with this graph. What we're really looking at is a history of Bristol Bay in terms of sockeye salmon production. Um, the first thing that jumps out at me really is the Quijack. So each of the river systems is represented by a different color. And the first thing that jumps out at me is the Quijack River system that's shown in yellow. So uh, what we can see is that uh, just how dominant the Quijack River system was for much of the 20th century. And then as we move into the late 80s and into the mid 90s, we see a really uh, strong uh, cycle of production, consistent period of production. And this was really characterized by uh, production really begin to diversify across rivers. And Igigik here in the dark blue really came on as a dominant producer. Then uh, moving, moving right, we see another uh, seven year cycle of really strong, consistent production. And that is certainly characterized by diversification across rivers. And then perhaps most interesting are this most recent set of years where we're really seeing record breaking um, or record setting production in Bristol Bay. And then of course, on the very edge, right hand edge over here, last year's a uh, run that exceeded 59 million fish and was characterized by really strong production to east side rivers, Naknek, Quijack and Igigit. So uh, it is this return data, Bristol Bay return, sockeye salmon return data, coupled with specific age class data, that is the primary data set that goes into the forecast. However, as we have uh, begun to incorporate artificial intelligence or machine learning methodology into our forecasting, there are other data sets that now play a role in some of these predictions. Uh, things like sea surface temperatures and abundance of other salmon species during Bristol Bay sockeye, uh, sockeye's ocean phase. And you'll hear more specifically about the machine learning methodology from uh, Dan Avanda, who's going to speak after me. But for the moment, specifically, we're interested in uh, the next chapter of this story, so to speak. And that is the expectations for 2021. So with that, uh, we'll move to uh, the complete forecast table as we release it each fall. Uh, I'll point out that here on the left-hand side, this is the exact same table that we started with in the first slide. Of course, uh, we take those predictions uh, by river system and by dominant age class of sockeye, and we we get we uh, total those by river system. And again, uh, expect total forecast for 2021 sits at 50.9 million sockeye. We provide uh, an estimate of escapement. Uh, this is our best estimate of escapement, giving uh, runs of this magnitude uh, to each river. And we also provide an escapement of uh, the South Peninsula catch. So it is these two, the estimation of escapement and an estimate of South Penn catch that we remove from these river totals to come up with a, a forecast of inshore harvest. And so we would, in numbers of fish, we would expect in 2021 to have an inshore harvest of 36.9 million sockeye, given a run of 50.9 million sockeye. So we take uh, that inshore harvest in numbers of fish, and we then use uh, average estimates of average weights of sockeye to generate a forecast in pounds. So uh, for 2021, uh, we, we 
used average weights of two ocean sockeye at 4.2 pounds and for three ocean sockeye at 5.7 pounds. So uh, though there are four age classes, we simply split this average weight by ocean age. So one twos, one threes, two twos, and two threes. Uh, the number to the, the left of the decimal point in the age naming scheme is freshwater age, and the number to the right is ocean age. So for two ocean sockeye, that's one twos and two twos. And for three ocean sockeye, that's one threes and two threes. It's really, in terms of the uh, sockeye size we, you, we see in the harvest each year, it is ocean age that really plays the dominant role in how, how big or small those fish are that we see. So, um, so our forecast in pounds this year, okay, we would expect uh, pounds taken in the inshore harvest to come to be about 179.82 million pounds off of an inshore harvest of 36.9 million sockeye. So just a little bit about those average weights. These average weights that we, these estimates of average weights that we use this, this year were certainly as small as we've used over the last uh, number of years of forecasting. So now what's in the middle of the screen with a black background is a straightforward graph that looks at Bristol Bay sockeye size in pounds. Uh, from 1980 to 2020, uh, the years, the time series is across the bottom, 1980 to 2020, and then simply sockeye weight in pounds along the left-hand axis. So the orange data points connected by an orange line are the average annual weights of three ocean sockeye. And the blue data points connected by a blue line are the uh, average annual weights of two ocean sockeye. And so I think the thing that uh, really stood out in, in this uh, graph of, of this 40 year uh, series of data is just how small Bristol Bay sockeye, relatively small Bristol Bay sockeye have been over the last three years. Uh, particularly last year with uh, the average weight of a three ocean sockeye and that's all three ocean sockeye, males and females, dropping below 5.5 pounds. So one thing uh, we can look and see that across this 40 year time series, uh, average weight of a three ocean sockeye really hangs in on average around 6.5 pounds. Now we have years where it goes up to 7.5 and years where it drops down to around six. But certainly, this is considerably smaller than we've seen over this time series. Now, it's not a complete surprise. Uh, we know that there is a reasonable relationship between total return or total run size of Bristol Bay sockeye and sockeye size. So it's an inverse relationship. In general, the relationship is the larger the total run, the smaller the sockeye we'll see. So. Uh, very small three ocean last year, coupled with very small two ocean. That average came out to just under four pounds last year for two ocean sockeye. I think the average was 3.99 pounds. Now, uh, we, so, and, and these, these numbers came off of a run that exceeded 59 million sockeye. So we would expect uh, to possibly see a, a very small uptick in fish size uh, if the forecast holds up and sticks at 50 million. Uh, so that is, that is the, the data behind these average weight estimates we used to generate a, a forecast in pounds. Now, uh, with that, we move to this table. It's certainly a, a brutal series of numbers to look at on the screen, but it's, it's really just a lot of very basic information. Uh, this, table, this is a table we provide with the uh, FRI forecast each year. It's again organized by river system here on the far left. The column in red next to it are the, forecast, the 2020, this year's forecast, the 2021 forecast, uh, values by river system. 
to the just to the right of that, we provide last year's forecast values by river system. And then uh, to the right of that are the 11 prior years of actual returns, sockeye returns to Bristol Bay. Now, uh, this table is always a very quick and easy way to start considering uh, the prior year's forecast performance or forecast era, and uh, whether that's humbling or not. We, um, last year, I noticed that uh, the forecast era we saw was followed a little bit different pattern than these prior few years with really large returns to Bristol Bay. And that is our forecast era was really kind of uh, some under forecast across river systems. Whereas in these prior years with really big runs to Bristol Bay, most of the forecast era was generated by a single age class of sockeye, notably the one twos, and usually within a year in one river system and across this six year time series in one or two rivers. So with that said, uh, moving to uh, this, a graph that we generate each year. Uh, anytime you're doing forecasting, you certainly have to consider forecast era if you're going and, and get an understanding of it, if you're going to get the most out of the forecast that you generate. So this is a two panel plot. There's a, a top panel here and a bottom panel. And into the, the top panel here, uh, the time series for uh, these, both of these uh, graphs are 2000 to 2020. Um, this top panel is percent deviation in forecast from the actual Bristol Bay return to each year. So the value for, for the actual returns to Bristol Bay each year are set to the zero line here in this top panel. And so for years where we have a red column that falls above the zero line, that would be over forecast in those years. And for years where we have a blue column that falls below the zero line, that would be under forecast in those years. And across this time series, 2000 to 2020, the percent error in forecast or specifically the mean absolute percent error is 15%. Now, uh, the bottom panel here is just shows Bristol Bay returns in millions of fish. So the blue data points are the actual Bristol Bay return numbers. And then we lay over that in red line, the FRI preseason forecast from this year, from those years. And this gives us really an idea of how these preseason forecasts have tracked to the actual return numbers. So always kind of the more recent years are, are always uh, stronger in our mind. One thing we notice here is there is a little bit more of a separation down here. So I wanted to take a moment to uh, look at, consider forecast era within that part of the forecast. The one thing we know is that really this whole series of years is, re is really big. So some under forecasting is not surprising when you have runs at the uh, big end of the distribution. Uh, the, the forecast era over those years has tended, certainly over the last four years, has tended to, to tick down. And the percent error from this series of years sits at around about 20%. I think it's actually after last year, uh, just under 20%, very close to 19%. So one way to look at a little detail, consider a little detail about this number of years that had very large returns. It's, it's a bit of a, a coarse way to do it, but just to plot total forecasted sockeye, and we do this by age group, one twos, one threes, two twos, and two threes, and compare it to total observed sockeye within those years. So, the years we're looking at here are 2014 to 2020. And what we can see, so the total forecast is sockeye for those years is in the blue columns. And the total observed sockeye returns in those years are in the orange columns. 
So what we can see is that really the, the bulk of our forecast era across these really big uh, returns in from 2014 to 2020 really falls within one age class and that is the one two age class. Um, a, some separation there is between our forecasted values and, our, and the observed numbers. We see a little bit uh, in the one three age class and uh, actually almost all of this forecast uh, what's wrapped, what we could be construed to be forecast error came from last year and really strong 1-3 production uh, on the east side. So uh, with that, uh, I will stop there and we will uh, try to answer any questions. Yeah, so if anyone has a question about this, about Chris's presentation, please type it into the Q&A box and we'll field it or raise your hand and we will give you the mic. You'll have other chances to ask questions at the end of all the presentations too, if you wish. All right, well, uh, I guess we'll move to Dan. Dan, if you want to put your presentation up. Uh, the next presentation is by Dan Ovando, who is going to talk about an extension of um, some of the methods that Chris just discussed. This is the machine learning uh, approaches to making forecasts um, that was funded in, par in part by the RSDA. So here's Dan. And you're still muted, Dan. There we go. Sorry about that. Got stuck on the presenter. Um, all right, you guys seeing my slides here? Yes, we are indeed. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks everybody. Um, appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit today, um, like has been mentioned before here, about our efforts to improve the preseason sockeye forecast for Bristol Bay using um, artificial intelligence and specifically machine learning. Um, so um, there's gonna be this, you know, machine learning can seem kind of complicated at its core. So we're gonna try and kind of boil this down to more understandable terms um, and kind of motivation for why we think this is important. So as Chris pointed out right earlier, things have been changing a lot in Bristol Bay. And we're gonna walk through this graph fairly slowly here. So what we're looking at here are three ways of looking at the same data. In every row are the total uh, returns in millions of sockeye to Bristol Bay over time, right? Going from the 1960s on up to the modern era here. And so you can see in the top row here, this is just the total returns over time. And you can see right off the bat that again, so things have really been changing over this period. We really moved from this kind of spiky behavior back in the day to kind of this like more sustained, I would almost call it like regime like behavior lately where we get kind of these long periods of ups and then kind of slower periods of downs and ups again. And then when we start to look within these returns, we can start to kind of see where these changes are coming from. So if we look at this middle row here, and again, this is something that Chris kind of already was looked at in his presentation, we can see that the river systems that are contributing to the total runs have changed a lot going back from this kind of Quijack dominated system back, you know, here in the 60s, on up to a much more diverse mix of river systems in the modern era. And even the Quijack system itself has kind of changed dynamics a lot. It's not like we've kept the same Quijack dynamics and added new things on top of it. So now, for example, we're seeing a lot more returns from the knack-knack and the like. Um, there's a, it's the wood um, in, the, in the recent years there. Um, so a lot of changes in the river systems and then as Chris pointed out, we're also seeing massive changes in the age groups that are coming back here. So now again, same plot, but now the colors show the total number by age group that are coming back to Bristol Bay. And we see again, whereas it used to be dominated by these two, two fish, in these recent years, these massive returns that we've been seeing have been made up largely by these one, two and one, three fish. 
um, that have really kind of changed the dynamic. And like Chris showed you in that last graph, that's kind of where some of the challenges for the forecast have come up lately and that we've been seeing just much bigger one, two returns than kind of the traditional forecasting methods have, uh, have predicted going forward. So all that's again, to drive home the point that, you know, there's clearly some predictable dynamics in the system and, you know, going especially back in the past, the FRI was doing a really good job of capturing these, but recently some things have started to change that it seems like we'd like to develop some models to kind of try and tackle this to see can we start to predict these returns with these increasing numbers of one, two and one, three fish in these systems like the wood that just weren't that big of a deal back in the day. Okay. So that's kind of the motivation. Um, so let's talk a little bit about artificial intelligence itself then and why we might think it can be a useful approach here. So traditional forecasting models that you might be familiar with basically work by assuming very specific forms of the way the world works. So this is something like a sibling regression model where maybe we say, all right, if we're trying to predict the number of one three fish that come back this year, we make that some linear function of the number of one, two fish that came back last year, right? So if we saw a whole ton of one, two fish, it probably means it's going to be a good year for one, three fish and so on and the next year, so on and so forth. Um, machine learning, which is a type of artificial intelligence kind of flips that problem on its head, right? So rather than saying, all right, here's the data and here's our model of the world, now let's make predictions. Machine learning says, given the data, it tries to learn what the best model of the world is to make predictions. And yeah, you know, that's a fairly complex idea. So we're gonna again, walk through this a little bit here. So the big advantage to that is again, rather than us humans having to kind of think through, well, I think that salmon is, you know, number of returns last year plus sea surface temperature divided by PDO and something else, right? We can just say, given all those data, the machine can learn what the best way to use sea surface temperature and PDO and past returns and all that stuff is to make a good prediction for how many salmon are going to show up next year. So that's the plus side to it. The downside to it is that it turns things into a bit of a weird black box. There's not really any mechanisms in here, right? Where when we look at, again, that idea of the number of one, three fish being a function of the one, two fish, we can understand that, we can think about that, it makes sense. Whereas these machine learning models, they're these weird black boxes, we don't really know what's going on inside, we just kind of look at how well they predict and use that to decide if they're doing a good job or not. So let's take a look at an idea of this, right? So this is an, ex what, an example of a machine learning model trained to predict cats, for example, right? So suppose that we had a, our job was we wanted a model that looked at a picture and said, is there a cat in this picture, yes or no, right? You can imagine that you as a human being could think of a bunch of rules for that. Like, all right, if its nose looks like this, if its eyes look like this, if its ears look like that, then it's probably a cat. But you can imagine that, well, maybe, you know, camera angles come in all kinds of different weird angles. You know, maybe, you know, the cat's got its eyes closed. There's all kinds of weird things with that. So rather than doing that, what machine learning does is say, if you feed the model a bunch of pictures of cats and things that are cats, things that are not cats and tell them you know, which do or do not have cats, machine learning models break this image of a cat down into all these little component parts, then reassemble it into things and learn to notice that, okay, if it's got this line, that line and that line and those things together form something that looks like this and that and that it's probably a cat, right? Which is much, you know, Again, it's a complicated process, but it allows the machine to do it on its own. To look at another idea of this, right? This is an algorithm trained to identify elephants. And the key, the colors you're seeing here, this is basically where the model was focusing in on. This is where the model was saying, this is the part of the picture that was telling me that this was an elephant or not. And what's really important is you'll notice it's actually not paying all that much attention to the trunk here. And that's because this model was actually tasked with not only identifying elephants, but separating out African and Indian elephants. And so what it basically noticed is there's something about the shape of the elephant's ear and head and kind of the ratio to its body size that is really important for telling apart, not only is this an elephant, but is it an Indian or an African elephant, right? And again, this is all without the humans doing it. The, all the humans do is pass it a database that says these are a bunch of elephants, now figure out a way to tell which kind they are basically. 
So that's machine learning. And now our goal is to turn that loose onto salmon, right? So we're gonna use that same process now, but now instead of saying, is this an elephant? We're going to say, figure out how many salmon are coming next year. That's the idea here. Um, so the goal of this project then was to unleash machine learning on the Bristol Bay salmon runs to try and predict the number of returns by river system and age group, and then compare the performance of these machine learning models to other types of models. Again, really simple things that just say that like, the number of salmon that come to the wood this year is going to be equal to the number of salmon that came back to the wood last year. And more complex things, things like dynamic linear models that Curry's been leading, that are kind of an in-between, if you will. They still kind of have the structure to them, but they're much more flexible, and they allow the models to learn, for example, that maybe these relationships have changed over time. And then we're going to assess the performance of these models at different resolutions. All right, so that was a lot of background here. Let's look at some results. There's a lot going on in this figure, but I want you to focus in on two pretty simple things. The gray area in the background here, these are the observed returns over time of sockeye salmon to each of the river systems in different panels here. And then the points are the predictions, the one year ahead forecasts made by different kinds of models. And what the important Thing to take away here is that you know we're able to find some pretty good models for some of these systems um, so for example here the boosted regression tree which is an example of a machine learning model was really able to make some pretty substantial improvements to the forecasts for egegek for example and again these things aren't magic bullets right you know there's some weird outlier years here for it's a little hard to say i think that's 20 16 maybe um, you know, it predicted a massive year there that just didn't happen, but in general, it's been able to kind of capture some of the big dynamics here, as was the dynamic linear model in places like uh, Gushik. Um, so at the system level, we're able to see some improved performance. And part of the reason for that is that these models were able to do a much better job at predicting these really, these one, two and one, three fish that are an increasing part of the run these days. So this is the same graph, kind of graph, but now instead of by river system, we're looking at age groups. So what's really important, as you can see here, that for both the one twos and the one threes, these models did a really, really, really good job of predicting how many fish were going to come back in particular for the one threes in these recent time periods here. And in particular, the one three, this kind of big spike in the one threes and to a lesser extent, the one twos here. So the take home of that then is zooming out to get to the whole system level. Like Chris was showing you earlier, um, the FRI forecasted under forecasted kind of the recent years here. Again, in this period where we've seen a lot of change in the river systems and the age groups that make that up. And the important thing to note here is that the machine learning model was able to capture that big increase. So it, cor it correctly predicted this kind of big pulse of just, you know, massive, massive years we've seen lately, you know, a little under it over in some of these years here as you'd expect but capturing that idea of a much bigger increase in recent time but what's kind of important about this work is we were able to show that there's no silver bullets here all i want to take you would take away from this graph is that what we're looking at here is the text says what model was best for different age groups and river system combinations and the important thing here is that there's a bunch of different text here, right? Different models worked best for different age groups and systems. And in some cases, the traditional FRI forecast was by far the best thing we had going, like for one threes and knack knack. Whereas for one threes in Egegek, for example, these machine learning approaches really added a lot of forecasting power uh, to the models here. In other places, things like the dynamic linear model that Curry has been leading really gave us our best improvement. And so what we're working on now is figuring out how do we kind of incorporate all these new kinds of models together into the same kind of process we've used for the FRI in the past, where we're going to, rather than relying on just one model, say, how can we kind of use the best parts of all these models to generate one forecast in you? But with the goal being that by building in these newer models like machine learning, we can start to leverage that increased predictive power for these one, two, and one, three fish in particular and hopefully use that to kind of capture this new state of the, uh, of the system that we're seeing in Bristol Bay for sockeye in particular. Um, and then you know, going forward, building that in to augment the traditional FRI process as we've been doing it in the past. So um, this work is, uh, is currently um, out for review in a scientific journal. Um, and what we're looking at now is basically saying that 
we think we've got some good evidence that we're doing about as good of a job predicting as, as the data allow us to. And so now we're focusing in on where could we put investments in new data collection that could really get us to the best bang for our buck in improving forecasts. And kind of turning these tools loose on some new ideas like focusing on run timing and prediction of new species like pink sand. Um, and so with that, uh, that's about all I got. So I'll pause here for questions and uh, you can reach me anytime at that, uh, excuse me, email. Dan, right there. Why don't you tell them what your forecast for 2021 is based on machine learning? I keep forgetting to do that. The forecast, the machine learning forecast for next year, there's a couple different ones, but most of them are hovering between 50 to 55 million uh, for the total returns there. So pretty similar to the FRI forecast that, uh, that Chris put up there earlier. Um, so another big year, but you know, at least the models that I'm running so far aren't calling for 60 or something like that, but they're still calling for in that 50s range. So yeah, if you have questions for Dan, please type them in. We have a couple of questions that have come in here late that I, I think I'll answer here. One is the question about, do we know why huge runs equal small fish? And the explanation for this is pretty straightforward. If there's a lot of fish coming back, there's probably a lot of competition for feed out there in the ocean. And the fish dose just don't grow as fast as they do when there's fewer fish and there's more food to go around per individual fish. On top of that, we also know there's pretty strong competition between other species like uh, pink salmon and chum salmon such that as their biomass or their numbers are high on the high seas that uh, uh, Bristol Bay fish tend to be smaller but the year-to-year -year variation between Bristol Bay run size and fish size is really the fact that they're competing with each other. And then a second question is a question about whether there's any, any evidence that pre- canneries that the year-to-year uh, -year variation in, in runs were more spiky or more variable um, than we see now. And really the simple answer there is the data don't exist to, um, to really assess that. If we look at theory, if we use theory to ask that question, it's actually possible the runs were more variable prior to harvesting because there were so many fish returning to the spawning grounds. But that speculation we do have some ways to uh, reconstruct what long-term densities of fish were in these lakes prior to fishing. And that's from the uh, records at the bottom of nursery lakes in the lake sediments. Um, so we can reconstruct estimates of how many fish were in those lakes, but the problem is the sediments are a sort of a running average of about five to 10 years. So we can't really answer the question about whether the runs were more spiky from year to year prior to uh, commercial fishing. Let's see. Uh, There's a couple of questions yeah. here, Daniel. I might jump yeah. in. Uh, Norm asked uh, whether or not the, the AI forecast work influenced the 2021 FRI forecast. The answer is yes. So the way we construct the FRI forecast is to look across these different prediction structures or prediction models and look at which has had the best performance recently. So the answer is yes, this all feeds into the, the forecast we put out for 2021. And then um, I think I'll, Michael Link or Michael L, I assume that's Michael Link had a question about uh, whether or not there was a hunch about what other information might improve forecast performance. Um, and, and my sense is, and I'll let others jump in after that, what we've seen from other systems in other areas throughout the state is indices of abundance after fish have entered the ocean during that first fall and winter in the ocean seem to be decent predictors of survival. So that that's a type of information that I think could help improve forecast performance. Yeah, thanks, Grant. I'll, um, I'll add quickly to that, you know, looking at one of the things you know, the nice thing about like the elephant example that I showed is there's a way, there's kind of an intuitive way to visualize that, right? You can kind of put that on there and say, oh, look, the, you know, the algorithm's queuing in on the ears, right? There's not really as clean of a way to do that for this kind of problem where we're trying to predict numbers, but we can kind of look at what types of information the models are queuing in on. And that's what this graph here is. And I'll talk through this. We don't have to look through here. The important thing is that um, what the machine learning models were doing, which some of the traditional methods weren't doing, was looking at correlations across river systems. 
So saying that, for example, if you want to predict a Gushik, um, rather than just looking at a Gushik, the model is telling us that if you know something about returns, that knowing something about returns at Egegek tells you something about future returns at a Gushik. Right, so the model is able to tell stuff like that. And then another important thing that we added in here, and this alludes to uh, what Daniel was talking about, was information on other Salmonids out there. And we don't know the direction in here. There's no mechanism or anything like that. But this tells us, for example, that for some reason, right, you know, the number of chum in Western Kamchatka seems to be some kind of useful predictor for the number of salmon that are coming back to Agushik. Now, we don't know why on that result. You know, it could just be a correlation that's telling us about something else. But this kind of analysis can kind of tell us something about, you know, the value of thinking about things like sea surface temperature, uh, which was one of the things we include here, Pacific decadal oscillation data. And so these we're kind of pouring through these to think about where are some other areas that we could collect data to, um, to improve the models, like Curry said. And I think, you know, some just totally new areas, some things about, you know, the returns or the size of the fish might be a very interesting way to start going from here. But the model can tell us a little bit that thinking about kind of not just at one system, but looking at these interactions across systems and across species with the environment can, uh, can help us out with these forecasting tools once in a while. Okay, I think we'll um, move ahead. We're running a bit long. We'll, we'll hold the questions for the end, but let's try to get through the, the presentation so people can drop off unless they wanna stick around for a Q&A. Uh, so I'm next. Um, Clean up my desktop a bit here. Can someone give me a thumbs up? See it? Okay, good. Yeah, so I'm just going to give a bit of an overview of the state of the ocean right now and what we've seen the last few years. Um, a lot of this was input from Nate Mantua, who's at NOAA, uh, used to be part of our group. Now he's at the Southwest Fishery Science Center, but he really monitors the state of the North Pacific. And I'm going to show you a couple maps here. I just want to orient you to the upper left panel here. And what you see in black and white, of course, is the coastline. You can see the Alaska Peninsula right here. Um, here's the uh, Southeast uh, Bering Sea. Here's the Gulf of Alaska. And what's plotted in color are contours of temperature above or below the long-term average. And what is shown, and then the color corresponds to either cooler or warmer than average. So if it's white, it's a zero, which means that for a given year, um, any area that's colored white is about equal to its long-term average sea surface temperature. So what I'm showing here in these two panels are the ocean temperatures that were observed in summer for the 10 best years in Bristol Bay's uh, sock, uh, sockeye returns between 1960 and 96, compared to the bottom panel, have the same map. Again, we have contours of deviation and temperature for the 10 worst uh, years for sockeye survival. And what you see is that on the top, the 10 best years for sockeye survival tend to be warmer than average. So we're seeing some greens and some yellows and there are small numbers here, but the, the simple point is that during years where sockeye smolts have high survival rates, the coastal ocean tends to be warmer than average. Um, if we go to the 10 years with the lowest sockeye survival, you see the blues and the purples now showing up which says that the coastal ocean during the summertime tended to be colder than average um, in years that had relatively low sockeye survival in, in Bristol Bay, okay? So we're gonna compare those to what we've seen recently. So these are the sea surface anomaly maps as we call it, an anomaly is a deviation from the long-term average. Again, to orient you, here's the Alaska Peninsula, here's Bristol Bay. And this is showing for 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019. Again, these are deviations from the long-term average during summer. And basically, if you scan across all these maps, you're seeing a lot of red and a lot of orange, which says that the sea surface temperatures were substantially warmer than the long-term average for each of the last five years between 2015 and 2019. 
fish that we're seeing that we will see this coming summer uh, would have left as smolts in 2018. So here you're seeing lots of greens and yellows. So this is at least a degree Celsius warmer than average. So that should have been good conditions. Um, 2019, our fish that are gonna come back this year is two ocean fish. You can see that that blob of really warm uh, red uh, water during the summer of 2019. That was the year where we broke many temperature records across Alaska. So the fish we're seeing uh, that we will see this summer were mostly left to the ocean as smolts during these two years. If we look back at the last three years of really high returns to Bristol Bay, this is what the maps look like. And you can see there was a lot of red and green in those maps as well. So these banner returns that we've been seeing the last five years um, are correlated with sea surface temperatures that were substantially warmer than average when the fish hit the ocean as smolts. If we look at 2020, this is the same map again, just zoomed in a little bit. Again, here's Bristol Bay. Um, summer temperatures, again, are greens, yellows, and some reds. That coastal ocean, again, in 2020 was relatively warm. It wasn't quite as hot as we saw in 2019 and a couple of years before that but it's still substantially above the long-term average from 1980 to the present. So again, based on correlations with sea surface temperature, we should expect high survival of fish that went to the oceans in these years. And that, should, that sort of backs up um, the, the relatively high forecast that uh, Chris and, and Dan presented. Um, it's important to put this in a longer term perspective. So these are the Eastern Bering Sea, sea surface temperatures for the summer going back to 1940. And you can see that most years it bounces around between nine and 10 degrees Celsius. Um, a couple cold years here. And then in the, in the 90s, we got a couple warm years. And then look at this collection of data points um, starting about 20, 14, I guess it was, you know, they, the observations were literally off the charts. So we had to rescale the chart here to capture these particularly warm uh, sea surface temperatures. These are the temperatures that were referred to as the blobs um, that developed in the 2014. The blob went away in intensity in 2017 and 18, but it came back pretty strong in 2019. So we've had this persistence, persistent run of warm temperatures in the eastern Bering. And these are, of course, the ocean conditions that uh, Bristol Bay smolts hit when they, when they get to the ocean. Um, compare that to the Gulf of Alaska. This is relevant for Bristol Bay sockeye because the smolts migrate around the Aleutians and down into the Gulf of Alaska, which is where they're putting on much of their growth. And the same general pattern seen there in the Gulf the temperatures are warmer, but again, the last five, six years have been part of this apparent regime of, of warm, uh, consistently warm temperatures. Um, and just to put those two on the same map, you can see the Gulf is always warmer than the Eastern Bering. Um, but the important thing here is that um, the Eastern Bering is cold enough that it seems to still be in a sweet spot for, for sockeye survival. For those of you who are keeping track of how sockeye runs are doing for rivers that dump into the Gulf of Alaska, they're hitting these sea surface temperatures. Um, and as you know, places like the Copper River and South have really had uh, really poor returns of sockeye the last few years. Um, from the perspective of Bristol Bay sockeye, this is what the smolts are encountering, which is really the survival bottleneck the adults are encountering more of this, which is presumably after the survival bottleneck has been passed through. So I wanted to put a little perspective on this relative to the errors in our previous uh, forecasts. Um, so these are the forecast errors. I have flipped the axis here. So what these are is the observation relative to what was forecast. And you can see that 2014 to 2020, there were more fish that returned than we forecast. And some of these numbers are pretty big. They're on the order of 10 million fish or so. This is what Chris showed earlier. On the bottom panel is what I'm, what I'm showing here 
is the lagged sea surface temperatures when these fish hit the ocean. And what you can see is um, for 2015 to the present, most of these sea surface temperatures were one to two degrees warmer degrees Celsius than the long-term average. And they're associated with uh, these uh, runs that exceeded our forecast. And if we push this through to 2021 and 2022, that's this coming year and the year after, the fish that come back in those years encounter these warm sea surface temperatures when they left as smolts. So this correlation supports both Dan's and Chris's forecast that they were that they just presented for a pretty big return. In fact, if you were a betting and a, and, a, and a crazy better, you might say that our forecast may actually be low, given that we've had this run of under forecasts, even though the runs have been big. Uh, it's, it's been in this uh, run of, of sea surface temperatures that have been remarkably warm, and it appears to be good for uh, Bristol Bay sockeye. Again, if you're looking south of the uh, uh, Alaska Peninsula at Copper River and other places like that, um, the returns have really been meager and really low associated with these sea surface temperatures south of the Alaska Peninsula. Um, just want to finish with a, with a, a little bit of a uh, video here that's going to show you what this um, ocean temperatures are doing. Hang on, let's stop this. Okay, so what this is, is an animation. So what we're looking at here is the North Pacific Ocean. Here's Alaska, here's the Bering Sea, the North, uh, here's Bristol Bay. And again, what we're doing is plotting uh, temperatures as a deviation from the normal condition at every location on this map. So here, for instance, in the subtropical Pacific, it looks a bit orange. That means for this date, so this is the year 2020, April 5th, you know, that water was about one degree warmer than average last year, okay? So I'm gonna play this and you'll see how things develop. Uh, one of the things we do see here last year was indications of a weak El Nino. So conditions are a little warmer than average down there on the equator, that's where the, the conditions set up. And I'm just gonna play this and slow it down a bit. So we're clicking through, this is April last year, all this warm water in the North Pacific, it was warmer than average. This is summer, let's slow this down a bit more. There's midsummer, stop. So this is last September, you can see red here. I'm having trouble getting it all on my screen. There we go. Um, Last September, uh, September 20th, you can see that lots of red here, which means the sea surface temperatures were three degrees or so warmer than average for a typical September last fall. The other interesting thing though, is that you see on the equator here, that blues are starting to show up and those blues show colder than average uh, conditions. And this is the, the hallmark of a La Nina. So La Nina, results eventually in cooler conditions up in the North Pacific. And you'll see this play out now as I play it forward. Um, Daniel, I don't think the animation is showing for us. Oh, okay, shoot. Oh, shit, okay. Thanks, Ray. Let me see if I can new share, that's why, okay. You guys can see that? Yeah, we can. We see the website. Okay, so I'm going to start over here. Okay, sorry, I'm going to start over. This is what I'm showing here is the map of the North Pacific, okay, for the whole world. And just like those earlier maps I showed you, we have contours of deviations in temperature from normal in that location at that time of year. So for this observation, this is the 13th of December in the year 2020. You can see some orange off here in off the coast of California, which means it's about one degree Celsius warmer than average. I'm gonna play it forward now and you'll see how things develop. I, I mentioned here, there's some blue right here along the equator. This is the, the fingerprint of a La Nina that's starting to set up. 
And as we play it forward, you're going to see that La Nina progress into the uh, North Pacific uh, and it is affecting the current conditions we're seeing right now. So I'm going to play this forward. So now we're at the 17th of January. There's February. Now we're back, sorry, now we're back to 2020. Moving forward through last winter, it was up here in Alaska, it was warmer than average off the coast. There's May, June, there's July. So there's stopping it, that's last July. You can see the whole North Pacific, particularly Bristol Bay and the Gulf of Alaska were distinctly warm. The equator here is about average. I'm gonna play it forward a bit. Okay, here's September. September again, really warm conditions up in the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska, but this is where we're starting to see really cold temperatures on average along the equator, okay? And this is the leading edge of that La Nina that's now setting up. I'll play it forward now to the current. You can see this warm water up in the North Pacific starts disappearing. So this is now, this is the end of January and basically the Bering Sea, Gulf of Alaska are white here, which is about exactly average over the last 40 years or so. And we see this big strip of blue water along the equator. So what this is projecting is a La Nina condition for the next year or so. Okay, I'm just gonna finish up here. Are we back? Can you see my original PowerPoint again? Do I need back to, to the check? PowerPoint, yeah. Okay, back to the PowerPoint. Um, and then this is what the forecast is for the rest of this winter. Um, this was a forecast made by NOAA back in December, I think, and you can see is what they were projecting was the odds were for colder than average temperatures along the coast, which I think is what we're seeing right now. Um, this is through the end of the winter, but basically the expectation for, for Alaska and coastal Alaska is cooler than average moving into next summer. They haven't released the forecast for next summer yet, but um, I don't know when they're gonna do that. But uh, if anything, it won't be hotter than it was in the last couple of years. Bottom line of what I just showed you is that the uh, sea surface temperatures that were so absurdly warm in the last five years are actually correlated with uh, high Bristol Bay returns. And that's, probably the reason we're, we're getting these high forecasts going into the next year. So if there's any quick questions, we'll take them. If not, we'll move on. Yeah, so uh, another question. Where is there a tipping point for Bristol for it being too warm? I mean, that's really the magic, the million dollar question is how much more warming can Bristol Bay and the Bering Sea withstand before it becomes uninhabitable for or, or less profitable for sockeye? And um, we don't know the answer to that. There will be a tipping point where it gets too warm for salmon, but we don't know if that's um, going to happen in the next decade or the next century. Um, Right now, uh, if you compare it to the Gulf of Alaska, there's still a couple of degrees of warming that uh, would have to occur in um, the Bering Sea for it to become as warm as the Gulf is when there are poor returns to the, to the Gulf. So simple answer is there's surely a tipping point. We don't know where it is yet. Okay, well, why don't, if people have questions, please type them in. I think we'll move on to uh, Curry Cunningham, who's going to talk a little bit about um, some of the in-season interpretation and forecasting uh, he does. Thanks, Daniel. Go ahead and share my screen. Actually, I think you need to stop sharing yours first.
All right. Can everyone see my screen? Perfect. Well, uh, thanks everyone for coming out today. I see a lot of familiar uh, names on the participant list. So thanks everybody for, for joining in this morning. Um, I'm gonna shift the focus a little bit from the preseason end of the spectrum uh, to the in-season end of the spectrum. So part of our role is to generate in-season predictions for uh, run size for Bristol Bay. And I'm going to talk more specifically about the Port Muller test fishery and some of the key insights uh, we get from, from that project and some of the challenges in terms of in-season interpretation as well. Given that everybody on this call is fairly familiar with the Port Muller test fishery, I won't go into too much detail or background or history. All to say that we, you know, we're all well aware the test fishery operates about a week before fish arrive inshore, capturing fish along a, a transect onshore to offshore and uh, providing a, a range of useful information that we can use in interpreting fish arriving to Bristol Bay in terms of their abundance, uh, the genetic composition of those fish, as well as the age composition. I see both Stacy Vega on the call, so my guru for all things age composition related to Port Muller, and also Tyler Dan, who's had a key role at the Gene Conservation Laboratory on the genetic side. So thanks both for being here and, and for your hard work as well. So from my perspective and our program's perspective, um, as we move through the season, we update our forecast for how many fish are returning both to Bristol Bay as a whole and by river system based on the reliability of different pieces of information as we progress through the season. So this is a, a general schematic of on the x-axis is date and on the y-axis is, is forecast weight or basically the relative belief we have in different uh, pieces of information we can use to predict run size. So what we see is at the beginning of the season, all of our weight is on the preseason forecast. Uh, catch and escapement really doesn't tell you very much about uh, what total run size is likely to be, nor does the, you know, the first week of Port Muller test fishery operation have a lot of information. But as we progress here to the sort of middle of the season leading up to the peak, this kind of period between June 25th and July 5th, uh, predictions based on the Port Muller test fishery become more important. Catch and escapement can still give you some misleading signals about what the, uh, the end of season run size is likely to be. And then as we progress after the peak towards uh, the end of the season, that's when catch and escapement really tell the story. So all to say that, that our in-season forecasting methodology is based on looking at the various pieces of information that are available, comparing their performance to one another across years at different points in the season, and shifting our reliance uh, from one to the other based on their performance. So we'll be talking a bit more about this piece here, age-specific uh, Port Muller prediction and the signals we get from, from the Port Muller test fishery. So one of the ways that, that we go about predicting end of season run size is to look at the total or cumulative Port Muller test fishery catches here on the X axis for the four major age classes, one twos, one threes, two twos, and two threes up to a given point in the season and compare that across years to the end of season run size for each of those major age classes here on the Y axis. So looking at this, this bottom left panel here, these are two twos. Each of these points is an individual year from 1990 up through 20, uh, uh, 2019 in this case. Um, and, and what they show is the relationship through June 27th. And on the right are the four panels through July 7th. What was the total uh, cumulative port molar catch or catch per unit effort up to uh, here June 27th? for two twos only, and what did that translate into in terms of uh, total run size for that age class in a given year? And so what we see is that they're positive relationships. The more fish you catch out of Port Muller of a given age class through a point in the season, the larger that the run size tends to be. We also see that as the season progresses, so looking at June 27th here to July 7th, these relationships tend to get a bit better as the season progresses. So we get a bit better precision in being able to predict end of season run size and millions here on the y-axis based on the number of fish from each age class that have been caught in the Port Muller test fishery so far. But age composition also tells uh, an additional story about where those fish are likely to go. So here what I have, these bars, this is for 2020. 
are the preseason forecast proportions by age class. So one twos, one threes, two twos, and two threes. And these diamonds are the total port molar uh, test fishery catches or catch per unit effort broken out amongst those age classes. And they're colored by, by point in the season. But uh, the, the key takeaway from last year is that relative to our preseason proportions by age class, what we saw from the Port Muller test fishery was distinctly more one threes and distinctly fewer one twos than we were expecting on the preseason end. And what that showed is that for uh, districts like Igigik, uh, and Naknaquijak that we're expecting a lot more one three fish, the age composition was much more, uh, much similar. The age composition signal from Port Muller was uh, much closer or more similar to the expected age composition for the Igigik and Naknaquijak districts than it was for the Nushigak district. And sure enough, that's what we saw play out in terms of relative abundance compared with our preseason forecast. Last year, we had about 50% lower returns to the Nushigak district, primarily the Wood River system, an absence of one twos and more fish than expected, primarily to the Igigik district and, and Naknik Quijak district as well. So this in-season age composition signal from Port Muller actually tells us a lot about both uh, potential run size and, and where these fish are bound. You know, as we're, we're all aware, another key piece of information from the Port Muller test fishery is the genetic composition of fish passing the Port Muller test fishery transect. And there's a range of ways we can look at these data. But one of the most simplistic ways that I find really informative is just to take the daily index here, at least as we calculate it from the Port Muller test fishery across the season, and then break that out based on the genetic composition information um, for that date or for the, uh, the surrounding sampling period, depending on whether or not sampling occurred. And so what we can see is each of these vertical bars is broken up between Nushigak, Naknaquijak, Igigik in blue, and the Ugashik district there in green. So what we see here again in 2020, early season, we had a lot of fish bound for the Nushigak district, Igigik to some extent, and then we saw this shift kind of mid-season with slowing uh, returns of fish to the Nushigak district and sustained high proportions of fish bound for the Igigik and Naknaquijak districts and Ugashik here coming online towards the end of the season after July 5th. We can also look at this instead of daily indices, sort of daily snapshots of, of where fish are bound given uh, their passage past the Port Muller transect, we can add these up. So basically we have a, an index by fishing district for each day within the season. If we sum those up across the season, we get an estimate of the relative proportions of fish bound for each district to have passed the Port Muller transect up to a given point in the season. So if we look here up through basically July 2nd, 3rd, we saw that the, the cumulative line for the Nushigak district was above that for the other districts. So up until that point, the majority of fish to have entered Bristol Bay, and when I say entered Bristol Bay, to have come uh, past the Port Muller transect and either arrived inshore or were somewhere in transit between the Port Muller uh, transect and inshore districts. Up until that point, the majority had been bound for the Nushigak district and we saw this flip after basically July 2nd, July 3rd, we saw an increasing proportion of fish bound for the Naknaquijak and Igigik districts here. So there's a lot of useful information, both in these daily snapshots of what proportion of, uh, of fish passing the transect on a given day are bound for a particular district, but also looking cumulatively or in total across the season, where do we see the, the majority of fish to have passed the transect um, having been bound for up until, uh, up through a given point in the season? The other key piece of information we get from the Port Muller test fishery is a signal of run timing. So a lot of the predictors based on, uh, as I talked about before, age specific catches out of Port Muller and the relationship between that and end of season run size are really sensitive to deviations uh, from average run timing, as well as using catch and escapement to predict end of season run size throughout the season. If you have a, an early run, you tend to over forecast end of season run size. If you have a late run, you tend to under forecast end of season run size. But we can look at the pattern and catches out of Port Muller to get an idea of whether or not we have an early or late run uh, to Bristol Bay as a whole. 
So on the left, I have a series of panels. That red line is, is Port Muller index across time. The bars there in light gray and dark gray are uh, for Bristol Bay as a whole daily catch and escapement. So catch is the dark portion of the bar, escapement is the light portion of the bar. This is 2017. Put on a series of years all the way back to 2013 here. We can look at 2014, more or less average run timing. And what we see is that this, uh, the Port Muller test fishery daily catch rate or uh, the index kind of built out here through the end of June, uh, kind of the, the traditional peak in, in Port Muller test fishery catches and maybe sustained or started to drop off at that point. We can contrast that with a year like 2013, where Port Muller test fishery catches increased and began to decline before June 25th. That was a pretty good signal of early run timing, and certainly that transpired as well in terms of the inshore arrivals or inshore catch and escapement. And we can contrast that with a year like 2016, where we saw Port Muller test fishery catches continue to build out past that traditional peak in, in Port Muller catches around June 30th, out through July 5th, and out to basically the end of test fishery operation. And that turned out to be a, a very late year. So there is a pretty good signal of run timing from the distribution of catches out of Port Muller that can be informative in, in updating our in-season predictions. So one thing we can do, and one thing we, we do in practice, is to look at the, uh, the Port Muller test fishery catches. As I said before, we can use the genetic composition to break those up by district. So here we have the Igigik district, Nushigak district, Naknaquijak district here in 2020. These vertical bars are the, the district-specific index from Port Muller. And then we can fit a distribution to that and estimate when the, the peak in catches might occur for a particular district out of Port Muller and compare that to the average peak for that district in terms of fish passing Port Muller, that's the blue vertical dashed line. And where that peak in the current year is relative to past years gives us some information about when we're likely to see the median date or the 50% point uh, for arrivals to each district in terms of catch and escapement. So each of these figures at the side shows for each year, the relationship between when the peak in Port Muller catches occurred, and uh, when the median date or 50% point for the run was to each district. So all to say that we can use the pattern and catches out of Port Muller either on aggregate or broken out by district as an informative signal for how early or late the run timing is to each district, which is interesting on its own, but more importantly, we can use that to correct some of the other in-season predictions we make, particularly those based on catch and escapement. The other really useful exercise that we've uh, begun to do increasingly in recent years is to, to look at our expected distribution of inshore arrivals or expected uh, distribution of inshore catch and escapement given the preseason forecast, given the average spread of those catches across the season, and look at, on average, how long it's taken for fish to transit between Port Muller or the Port Muller transect and Bristol Bay, so our travel time, and then the average run per index, or the average number of fish that arrive inshore per fish caught out of Port Muller. And between the two of those, we can, we can take our expected arrival distribution inshore, lag that back in time to when those fish should have passed Port Muller, and scale that down based on the run per index. And what that does is it gives us here this, uh, as Chris likes to call it, the red tent, this distribution of expected Port Muller test fishery indices across the season, and we can compare that conditional on uh, the preseason forecast and compare that to what we see in actual indices across the season. So this is for 2020, these vertical bars for the actual observations. This uh, red distribution is, is kind of the expected distribution of Port Muller catches across the season. And what we can see is that in 2020, first we were, we were a bit behind. We saw these big uh, catches out here beyond June 30th, pretty good signal that things were running later than average and above our expectation for 2020, that red line. So suggesting both that the run was likely to be late and also likely to be above uh, average in terms of run size. So with that, I wanna thank uh, the Bristol Bay Science and Research Institute for their hard work in, in pulling off this test fishery year after year and Alaska Department of Fish and Game for their, uh, their role both in analyzing the age composition as well as the genetic composi composition information that uh, is really informative in season. And I'm happy to take any questions. 
I, because we're going so long, I think what I'll do is encourage people to type in your questions for Curry, and then we'll come back to them after the final presentation. Uh, that's one problem with academics. If you ask them to talk for 10 minutes, they always talk for 20. So we're running late today. Um, so our final presentation is Ray Hilborn, who's going to talk about the uh, an assessment he's been doing of the environmental impacts of harvesting and marketing Crystal Bay sockeye salmon. Assuming we don't have to wake Ray from his nap or something. Curry, Curry yeah, you just had to wake up here. Um, Curry, you need to stop sharing your screen. Okay, I'll share mine. Um, just a second. What's going on here? Hmm. Just a second. Um, what? Okay, so you should you are seeing my screen in theory. It's coming up. Not PowerPoint yet, is no. not responding. There we go. Okay, is that that showing now? First slide of a PowerPoint. Yes, indeed. That's good. Okay. All right. Good. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to try and talk briefly about uh, work we've been doing, partially funded by BBRSDA looking at some aspects of the environmental footprint of Bristol Bay sockeye salmon. Um, okay, come on. There we go. All right. Uh, so as you may know, there's a very strong and growing anti-fish movement uh, in, ma in many places, well, in rich countries. Um, and uh, this is just an example of uh, uh, an article in the British magazine, uh, The Guardian. Uh, I doubt that many of you took part in the World Day for the End of Fishing, but there's an organization of, uh, to try to stop, uh, to stop all fishing. And almost all of this is uh, built on some very mistaken ideas about the relative impact of producing, catching and producing fish compared to alternative foods. Um, and uh, this has led to the so-called plant-based uh, movement with uh, uh, trying to uh, produce things that, that look and taste like fish that are produced from plants rather than from animals. Um, and uh, this includes uh, plant vegan, veg, vegan salmon. Um, so, uh, what I've been involved in for a number of years now is really trying to look at what are the environmental costs of producing fish and in particular producing salmon from Bristol Bay compared to uh, other foods. Um, and we've been covering this on our website, sustainablefisheriesuw.org. This is uh, just, a, uh, you, you can go to that website and read uh, some of the stuff we've, we've talked about there. Um, and this is just a, a quick uh, <clears throat> summary of uh, some of the, the big issues um, that is uh, comparing Bristol Bay sockeye to, let's to take the extreme vegan alternatives. So uh, let's just concentrate on that second row, bycatch and biodiversity. There is effectively almost no impact of the Bristol Bay salmon fishery on biodiversity, but plant-based foods rely increasingly on cutting down rainforests to expand uh, global plant-based uh, food production. I'm gonna talk about uh, some of these other things, greenhouse gas, nutrient release, um, issue of animal welfare, which is where a lot of people come to, veg to veganism, is yeah, we definitely kill fish. Now, mind you, you know, in, in the case of Bristol Bay, they're all gonna die a few weeks later. Um, uh, but what they vegan the vegans don't appreciate is that Producing vegan food kills lots of animals. I don't have time to go into the, uh, that in detail. 
Um, but the probably the most prominent plant-based food has been the Impossible Burger. And they have, uh, this is from some of their advertisements, comparing themselves to beef. And the number we're going to uh, look at carefully is this 3.5 kilograms of carbon for a pound of Impossible Burger. So question I've been asking is, how does a sockeye sandwich compare? And uh, I had previously done some work just comparing animal-based foods from a large literature review. Uh, and what you see here is the amount of carbon released to produce 40 grams of protein. So it's, think of it relatively. Uh, in red is aquaculture, in yellow is livestock, and in blue is fisheries. And what you see is that some fisheries are very, very good and some are uh, not good at all, um, both from a, 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 an aquaculture perspective and from a, uh, uh, a wild capture perspective. Uh, for our fisheries, most of the greenhouse gas uh, footprint comes from fuel use. And so this is uh, about a, a, a dozen or two dozen in individual studies of the total greenhouse gas production from the fuel compared to their total greenhouse gas production. And the bottom line is, yes, there's some energy that goes into the constructing the ship and the nets, but fundamentally it's all in the fuel. So what we've been doing is, uh, is collecting data, I started with collecting data on fuel from a number of uh, Bristol Bay processors who had data for their fleets of both uh, harvest and tenders, because to get the fish to the dock, you need fuel for both harvest and tenders. Um, and uh, if we look at the literature that's already published, comparing different the fuel use for different kinds of fisheries, they had there is a literature on salmonids, and the number is not very good. It's uh, about 800. I think I've got some, 886 liters per ton, um, and so you see that that is. Uh, really no better than finfish on average and near, not nearly as good as small pelagics, that's sardines and mackerel, which are really, really low. But the data we got for Bristol Bay processors uh, for harvest, uh, when, when they gave it to us separately for harvest, it was about 60 liters per ton, not 800. Uh, harvest and tender combined, a couple of companies, they, it was about 120. Uh, and tenders about uh, 75. So you're talking 120 to 130 liters per ton. So that's among the lowest uh, in the fisheries world. We also have uh, estimates for processing that is roughly comparable. Um, and that's, that's actually uh, Bristol Bay Salmon's uh, car carbon footprint for processing is a little higher than average because essentially all of the energy is coming from burning diesel, whereas if you've got a plant that's run by hydroelectric power, then its carbon footprint is lower. But let's stick with this 120 uh, liters per ton. Then you plug this into a thing called life cycle assessment that looks from catching the fish to landing to processing to shipment. And um, I've been working with some Swedish colleagues, um, Swedish and Canadian actually, uh, and the purpose of this particular study was to compare Alaska salmon to Norwegian farm salmon brought to Europe. And what you see is that sockeye fresh landing in Europe have a total carbon footprint of 14 kilograms per kilogram. So that's uh, a lot, uh, but if it's frozen, it's a little over two. And that's because if it's frozen, it comes by ship. If it's fresh, it comes by air. That's actually true for pink salmon and chum as well. And if you compare, compare that to Norwegian farm salmon to produce <clears throat> uh, Alaska uh, uh, sockeye, it takes about two kilograms of carbon to produce a kilogram of sockeye uh, fillets or uh, whether fresh or frozen. Uh, whereas to produce a farm salmon takes more closer to six. But uh, if you ship it, then the transport cost in gray is very little. If you fly it, the transport cost is very high. Um, so basically the bottom line is 
that uh, an impossible burglar, we don't have any numbers for fake fish, but there's no reason to think they're fundamentally any different, uh, that a car the carbon footprint of a wild Alaska salmon burger or salmon is about two kilograms of carbon per kilogram of product. Um, we've been trying to finalize this. We need a few more numbers. COVID really has been an impediment because plant managers just had so much to deal with last year. Uh, our major unknown at the moment is refrigerant use. Uh, a few of, few members of BBRSDA helped me with there. There's some other details with respect to processing we're trying to finish up. So thanks very much, and I hope I wasn't over five minutes. All right, thanks, Ray. I think we'll go to a general Q&A. Um, maybe before we get to that, I'll just uh, say a couple things about the field programs. Uh, first, uh, I think RSDA needs to be really commended for pulling off an amazing season last year. You know, the leadership of, of Andy Wink and people like Michael Jackson, you know, the ability of you guys to get organized, figure out how to test, quarantine, et cetera, and actually ha run a fleet is really remarkable. And, and uh, uh, you should be congratulated for having a successful season. And hopefully this coming summer will be at least as successful um, we also were able to run our season at a bare bones uh, level last summer, so we didn't lose any of our long term continuity in our data collection. And uh, right now we're hoping for the same mm -hmm. and maybe a little bit more towards normal this this coming summer as well. Um, but well, let's see, let's look at the Q&A. If, if anyone wants to make a comment, please raise your hand and we'll give you the, the mic. If not, please type your uh, your questions into the Q&A box. Most of the questions have been answered so far. There's one question here about a correlation of overescapement driving fish out of the lake after one year instead of two because of too many fish. Um, just a quick response to that. The, the data that do exist show the opposite trend that if there's a big escapement, typically the juvenile salmon grow slower and are more likely to stick around a second year before leaving as smolts. And the AI hasn't really been applied to look at that specific question. Well, I think we've succeeded in putting everyone to sleep for the day. Um, if there aren't any questions, maybe we'll sign off here. Uh, Andy, I don't know if you want to say any farewells. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to follow up with any of us if you, if you want to follow up on any particular topics. And uh, thank you for, for signing up today. Andy, did you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks to everyone for being here. And uh, I posted a link to our uh, YouTube channel in the chat. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Thanks to our panel. This was amazing presentations. I think uh, a lot of questions got answered and a lot of information was delivered. So um, yeah, thanks to everyone for pulling this off. It's great to be here digitally today. Thanks for the opportunity. Great. Thank you all. Appreciate everyone tuning in. You bet. Take care, everyone.